We know that OCaml's type inference system can take our code and determine the types of expressions without us needing to explicitly provide those types. For example, consider this function, which takes its argument x and returns x plus 1. OCaml correctly infers that this is a function of type int to int, but how did it know that? OCaml can make these inferences because there are constraints in the code that restrict what types are possible. Because we use the addition operator on x, we know that x must be an int, since the addition operator only works on integer values. And since we return the result of the addition, OCaml knows that the output must also be an int, since that's the type we get after adding two integers. This function as a whole must therefore have type int to int. But sometimes there might not be enough constraints in an expression to precisely identify all of the types. Let's take the example of the identity function, which is a function that takes an argument and returns that same argument unchanged. There are no constraints on what the argument is based on its usage. It could be an integer, it could be a floating point number, it could be a list. All we know is that whatever the type of the input to the function is, that must be the same as the type of the output of the function. Because of that, OCaml also doesn't have enough information to identify an exact type. Instead, OCaml reports the type of the function this way. These are type variables that could stand in for any type, and they're always represented as an identifier with a prefixed quotation mark. We usually read them as their corresponding Greek letters, so in this case, alpha to alpha. What this type is saying is that the function can take any type as input, call that input type alpha, and the output of the function will be that same type alpha. This kind of function, which can accept inputs of many types, is called a polymorphic function, with a polymorphic type. Polymorphism proves incredibly useful to us. Let's go back to the map function we looked at when we were talking about higher order functional programming. When we first wrote the map function, we wrote it as a function of type int to int, to int list to int list. It first accepted a function from int to int to determine how to transform each integer in the list, then it accepted a list of integers to process, and the function returned a new list of integers. Using this map abstraction, we were able to write a variety of functions that mapped integers to integers, including a function to increment a list of integers and a function to square a list of integers. But what if we wanted to map other types? We might want to double a list of floating point numbers, or take a list of pairs of integers and map them to a list of their products. Instead of mapping an int to int function, here we'd want to map a float to float function, or an int cross int to int function. One option would be to write different versions of the map function for mapping functions of different types. We could write one version for mapping floating point numbers to floating point numbers, and another version of the function for mapping pairs of integers to integers. But this goes against the edict of irredundancy. We've written the same code multiple times, and the only differences are the types of the input and output to the function we're applying to each element of the list. Instead, we can write a polymorphic version of this map function. Instead of having the function take an argument f of type int to int, we'll have f be of type alpha to beta. We're using two different type variables because we want to allow the function we're mapping to potentially map one type to a different type. We might map integers to floats, or floats to pairs of integers, or something else. Our input list will be of type alpha list, where each element is the same type as the input type to the function f. And the function will return a list of type beta list, where each element is the same type as the output type of the function f. And the rest of the map function looks exactly the same as what we've written before. This polymorphic version of the map function has type alpha to beta, to alpha list, to beta list, and it can be used to generically map functions over lists. For any types alpha and beta, this function accepts a function that maps values of type alpha to values of type beta, and then accepts a list with the values of type alpha. The alpha to beta function is applied to each of the values of type alpha to return a new list with values of type beta. It turns out that even without the explicit type annotation, OCaml's type inference system can infer these constraints automatically, but adding type annotations helps us to make our intentions clear.
Using this new map abstraction, we can write functions to map floating point numbers to floating point numbers, or pairs of integers to integers, or any other choice for types alpha and beta. We could similarly try to write polymorphic versions of other higher order functions we've seen, like fold and filter. But it turns out that OCaml comes with a built-in list module that already includes functions for mapping, folding, filtering, and a number of other list-related operations. Rather than rewrite the same code ourselves, we can make use of the abstractions provided by the list module. The list.map function behaves exactly like the map function we've just written. We provide it with a function from alpha to beta to apply to each element in a list of type alpha list, getting back a list of type beta list. We've seen how we can use the list.map function to apply any function to each element of a list. The list.foldLeft function uses a binary function to combine all the elements of a list one at a time from left to right. We start with an initial value of an accumulator of type alpha. Then we take a list of elements where each element in the list has type beta. One at a time from left to right, we apply this binary function. The function accepts the accumulator of type alpha and the current element of type beta and returns a new value for the accumulator. It needs to have the same type as the original accumulator value, so it's also of type alpha. After going through all of the elements in the list, we end up with a final value for the accumulator of type alpha. Say, for example, we wanted to take a list of truth values and count how many of them are true. We could use list.foldLeft and provide it with a binary function. The first argument is the accumulator, in this case representing the previous number of true values. The second argument is the current element. So if the current element is true, we want to increase the accumulator by one. Otherwise, we want to leave it alone. Then we provide an initial value for the accumulator, in this case zero, since before we look at any elements, we've counted no true values. And then we provide the list of elements to process. The list.foldWrite function is very similar, but it uses a binary function to process elements in a list from right to left instead of left to right. We take an initial list where each element has type alpha, and we have an initial value for the accumulator of type beta. The binary function takes the current element of type alpha and the current value of the accumulator of type beta and returns a new value for the accumulator of type beta. At the end, we end up with a final value for the accumulator of type beta. We could write our function to count true values in a list of bools using fold right as well. In this case, the solutions for fold left and fold right look very similar, though there may be other problems where one or the other ends up making for a simpler or cleaner solution. For filtering elements, we can use the list.filter function. This function first accepts a function of type alpha to bool. The input could be any type, but the output must be a bool, since it needs to return true or false to let us know whether we should include that element in the output list or not. The function then takes a list of type alpha list, and we return a new list of type alpha list containing only the elements that return true when the first argument function is applied to it. So we could write a function to filter a list of floating point numbers to only the positive ones by applying list.filter to an argument that checks if a floating point number is greater than zero. There are more list module functions too, all of which can be found in OCaml's official documentation. They all serve different purposes, but what they all have in common is that they're generic. They don't work just on int lists or just on float lists, but they work on any kind of list, taking advantage of polymorphism to allow the functions to work with any types of list we want while still ensuring that our code uses those types appropriately.